The Polykarpov I-16 was famous as being the first low-wing monoplane with an enclosed cockpit and a retractable landing gear to enter service as a military fighter. Admittedly, it rarely featured a fully enclosed cockpit on the front line, for reasons we will discuss shortly, but it was designed and built that way nonetheless. Like many Soviet technological stories from the 1930s, the story of the I-16 begins in a Soviet prison. Nikolai Polykarpov, along with Dmitry Gagorovich and several other aircraft designers, was employed at State Aircraft Factory No. 39. Employed is perhaps a loose term as they also ate, drank, and slept there, all under armed guard. There was a need to develop multiple new aircraft for the Soviet Air Force, also known as the VVS, and in 1929 Nikolai was working on something called the I-5, which would go on to become the I-15 biplane. He was also working on a monoplane fighter design as well, and at the beginning of the 1930s the VVS was looking to employ both biplanes and monoplanes in its combat squadrons of the future. There was still some hesitation about fully committing to monoplane designs, but the military could clearly see that the monoplanes were quickly becoming the future, and concept work began in 1932, with work beginning on the first I-16 prototype in June 1933. Like many aircraft of the time, it contained a blend of the old and the new, but in some ways it was a dramatic departure from previous aircraft designs, and in some ways it was revolutionary. It had a barrel-like wooden monocoque fuselage with fabric covering. This was a traditional start, and it was more due to the fact that Russia didn't yet have the capacity to mass-produce all-metal aircraft, rather than a lack of innovation in the design itself. Polykarpov wanted to keep the aircraft as light as possible, and the wood frame helped with that, but also to improve its lightness, the aircraft would only have a length of 20 feet. It had a large radial engine in the nose, and an equally large tail fin at the back. Its diminutive yet stocky appearance would eventually earn it the nickname Ishak, or Donkey. It also gave it an unorthodox centre of gravity that would lead to some interesting stability developments. The aircraft was initially designed to be equipped with two wing-mounted 7.62mm Shikast machine guns, however from the beginning some test pilots would protest that this armament was too light. Sadly, it was a matter that would not be rectified until combat reports confirmed their opinions. Along with the traditional stuff, the prototype had some more innovative features. It had a landing gear that could be retracted up into the wings, greatly aiding its aerodynamics. In a world dominated still by fixed landing gear aircraft, this was considered a real innovation, although there was the caveat that the pilot had to hand crank the gear to raise it up. It also had a fully enclosed glass canopy, one that could be slid back to allow the pilot's easy egress. In practice, the canopy would unfortunately underperform. The glazing was often of a very poor quality and was apparently a nightmare to keep clean, with many pilots opting to replace it with the short windshield that is often associated with the I-16 today. The prototype also featured large ailerons that ran along almost the entire trailing edge of the wing. These ailerons could also be operated as flaps, being able to droop at a 15 degree angle. This is somewhat seen as the predecessor of what we would deem as modern day flapperons. The first I-16 prototype, designated TSKB-12, took to the skies for the first time on the 30th of December 1933. It was designed to be powered by a license-built Wright Cyclone radial engine, however it was taking longer than expected to get approval, so the decision was made to fit the M-22 engine instead. It itself being a license-built version of a license-built version of the Bristol Jupiter engine. Eventually, a prototype was also built with the Cyclone engine, and the two were compared, beginning a trend that would see various engines fitted to an ever-increasing variety of I-16s during its development cycle. Initial reports during the first trials were good, and the aircraft was praised for its good manoeuvrability. However, it also demonstrated some rather terrifying instability when there was sudden control input. After much testing, it was found that although the aircraft could very easily wing stall with sudden control input, 
it would also find that the aircraft could naturally recover from these incidents, provided that power was kept applied and the pilots kept their stick in a neutral position. Full service trials began on the I-16 in 1934, and the first units of pre-production I-16 Type 1s were delivered that year. Stalin had been very impressed by the prototypes and even allowed them to participate in a flyover of Red Square. These early models were powered by the M22 engine, one that was preferred by pilots as the cyclone engines caused vibrations in the aircraft. The manually retracted landing gear had a habit of jamming due to its mechanical complexity, a problem that could only be solved in the air by great physical exertion of the pilot. This was an especially dangerous problem if you ever wanted to land again, and although it was eventually greatly improved in later models, the prototypes would often be flown with their landing gear kept down to avoid any potential fatal mishaps. The first full production version of the I-16 was the Type 4, which was still powered by the M22 engine. However, despite pilots' complaints about the Cyclone engine, a third prototype had been developed to use the new license-built M25, which was a copy of the Cyclone, and this resulted in the I-16 Type 5. To accommodate this new engine, the Type 5 had a new engine cowling, cooling and control shutters, and a redesigned exhaust system. The aircraft also carried over the additional pilot armour that had been provided on the I-16 Type 4. When it first entered service, the Type 5 was both the fastest and lightest production fighter in the world, weighing in at a relatively featherweight 1460 kilos and packing a top speed of 454 kilometers an hour. The Type 5 and the even lighter and more powerful Type 6 would see action for the first time during the Spanish Civil War in November of 1936. They performed well, outclassing their biplane opponents in speed and utterly surprising the nationalist forces that were encroaching upon Madrid. In their first engagement, a flight of I-16s claimed four enemy aircraft destroyed, and they soon began to dominate the skies over Spain wherever they went. This excellent start wasn't without its problems. It was quickly discovered that the guns of the I-16 tended to jam, and they were also difficult to aim, being fired via a cable on what was already a somewhat unstable airframe. It was also once again represented that the armament of the aircraft was too light, sometimes requiring many passes to inflict enough damage to force down an opposing aircraft. The I-16 was also found to be fragile at times. It was praised for its manoeuvrability and had a truly excellent roll rate, being able to perform a full aileron roll in about one and a half seconds, but it also liked to snap its wings when performing said rolls, especially at higher speeds, and it really didn't like high G turns. These issues, especially the ones regarding firepower, were addressed rather quickly. The wings were strengthened, and the I-16 Type 6 featured an additional gun mounted under the fuselage, and then the even more impressive I-16 Type 10 had four guns, two mounted on each wing. It also did away with the enclosed canopy completely, becoming the first I-16 to be fitted with the smaller windshield as standard. This improved the aircraft's combat effectiveness, as the pilots could not only see their enemies without straining, but could shoot more bullets at them too. But at the same time this improvement came along, it was largely offset by the appearance of the new German BF-109Bs, and in frightening numbers. By the end of the Spanish Civil War, 187 of the 276 I-16s deployed had been lost, but valuable lessons had also been learned. Firepower would never again be neglected, and the 4-gun Type 10 was now considered to be the absolute bare minimum in acceptable weaponry. Older Type 5s had their firepower augmented by the addition of two 20mm Shivat cannons, significantly improving their lethality against unarmoured targets. This is something that would be demonstrated first in the Far East at the Battle of Kalkin Gol. It would, however, also demonstrate the beginning of the I-16's obsolescence. They suffered heavy losses against the more sophisticated all-metal Japanese aircraft, especially the Nakajima Ki-27. However, the aircraft continued to receive upgrades and be produced in large numbers. It also continued to field upgraded weaponry, 
becoming the first aircraft to successfully use an air-to-air -air missile to destroy an opponent, when an I-16 fired an RS-82 unguided rocket at a Ki-27 in August of 1939. When Germany commenced Operation Barbarossa in the summer of 1941, many say that the I-16 constituted the backbone of the VVS, and when you look at the numbers, it's not surprising at all. At the outbreak of the invasion, over a third of the entire Soviet Air Force consisted of I-16s, fielded by 57 squadrons. Because of this, the I-16 bases were heavily targeted during the opening air assaults. In the first two days, just under 700 I-16s had been destroyed, many of them were on the ground. When the I-16 managed to get into the sky, its main opponent was the BF-109 ML series. It is here that we see some of the contrasting technologies and tactics that personified aerial combat over the Eastern Front so much, especially in the opening year of the conflict. The I-16 could be more manoeuvrable than the 109s, especially when it came to roll and flat turn performance, but the 109s had the superior straight line speed, climb and dive rates thanks to its more powerful engine and improved aerodynamics. This led to the somewhat stereotypical tactics of the German pilots flying higher to pounce on their slower opponents, and the Russian pilots using baiting tactics to drag their faster opponents down into the aerial equivalent of a knife fight in a phone booth. Gun for gun, the cannon-armed I-16s could more or less match the 109s, although they carried less ammunition. However, the cannon-armed I-16s were less numerous than the types equipped with just the four machine guns, and in that situation, the German fighters had a clear firepower advantage. The I-16 was also more fragile, with a tendency to catch fire and then stay on fire when hit, thanks to its wooden frame construction. By late 1942, the I-16 was beginning to be replaced by more modern fighters in the frontline role, but it had stood to the brunt of the aerial wing of the German invasion. Surprisingly, a large number of them survived to see retirement, perhaps a testament to the large numbers built during the war. Sources conflict wildly, some saying around 8,600 being built, some going as high as 20,000. The true number is no doubt difficult to get close to due to the secretive nature of the Soviet Union during the Cold War, and the large numbers of records being displaced or destroyed during or immediately following the end of the Second World War. Thanks to this large production number though, several I-16s survive to this day, including some that were restored to an airworthy condition in the 1990s. 